getting to infinity. Um, so if you've been reading along in the book of Exodus and studying, you'll notice uh, that God calls up Moses, and then he says, Moses, go down and tell the people what I just told you. Then he says, Moses, come, go up. <laughs> God tells him some more or writes something for him and says, go down, Moses, and tell the people what I just told you, and they respond, and he goes back up and says, Lord, here's what the people just, I mean, I know you know, but here's what the people <laughs> just said. So the next time you see a pastor preaching and they're going back and forth, <laughs> this is a picture of Mount Sinai <laughs> and, um, before Moses. Hey, Amen. Amen. Which means I should be like down here and stay, <laughs> stay, get me a slow stool and stay on the bottom because uh, Moses I ain't. Uh, but uh, we're going to be looking uh, tonight um, at uh, the book of the covenant. Okay, so that's, that's a stretch here in the book of Exodus uh, that runs uh, from chapter 19 forward. Um, and it's basically... Uh, God informing uh, the people of Israel, uh, this is what you're going to do, okay? So uh, buckle up, get ready, uh, because this is what I expect of you. Now, last week uh, didn't quite get as far as I wanted to, um, but the plan is we'll do the Book of the Covenant tonight, and we'll, do, uh, we'll talk about the tabernacle next time, and that should wrap up the book of Exodus and get, them, get us into the book of Leviticus. So last week, the milk of human kindness had soured a little bit, uh, but tonight I want you to kind of put on your thinking caps. We're going to have some fun uh, with no, nothing other than the law. Um, so, you know, with a little bit of imagination, hopefully I can point out some things that will be of help to you. Um, now, starting in chapter 19, this book of the covenant, uh, this is about the civil laws, okay? This is how um, the nation of Israel was to interact one with another, okay? So this is the, the basis, the foundation of a common law, all right? And God, when God tells uh, his people to do or don't do something, uh, he means it, okay? And there's uh, particular blessings uh, or um, curses, life or death, consequences. Uh, but let's, let's get into it, uh, chapter 19, uh, starting in verse 1. So in the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. For they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mount. So the mount is Mount Sinai. Uh, here we have the wilderness, and it's not just a wilderness, it's the desert, okay? So remember, uh, Adam was in a garden, he fell, uh, and the world becomes a wilderness. Uh, Israel was in the garden of Goshen, now they're in a wilderness again, but God is promising what? To get them back to a garden, a garden city, right? Flowing with milk and honey, it's the promised land. Um, so the wilderness is a picture of a place where God brings his people to prepare them. So the wilderness is a place of preparation, all right? I've got something really good in store for you, but you're not quite ready yet, all right? This was Adam's problem, okay? Adam tried to grab at the robes prematurely, all right? He wanted to have the kingly authority before he was mature enough to exercise it. And when he tried to exercise it, he just made a complete hash of it. He was, he was all wrong. Uh, but here, uh, God brings them to the wilderness. And the other thing that God does in the wilderness, in addition to preparation, uh, it's also a demonstration. Okay, uh, God is teaching something to his people. He's delivering a word. He's going to point something out. And so that's what's going on. Right? And they are camped. Okay, So they don't have a permanent dwelling yet, so you got to camp. All right, you gotta pack up the tent, you gotta load up the RV. Lo and behold, what's coming in a few chapters? A tabernacle, right? It's a tent, right? It's a movable house for God, all right? And, and camping does something uh, kind of unique, right? It puts, it puts us in a, a simple environment 
uh, it deprives us of essentially our will, right? Now you can go glamping, right? you <laughs> do it really fancy, uh, but if, uh, you know, if you don't have the rock star Winnebago, then <laughs> you, you do something different. You, you start to learn that you're kind of dependent on certain things. You know, maybe you're dependent on the people that you're with. Um, and you begin to have a, a newfound gratitude for all the gifts that God has given, right? All the conveniences and, um, you know, proximity to a place to get food uh, <laughs> and quickly and, you know, you don't have to cook it as opposed to, you know, making your fire and cooking it and washing up and bedding down and all that kind of stuff. So there's something unique and special that happens uh, when you camp. Now, God didn't expect the nation of Israel to camp very long. Uh, he knew they would be camping longer than they expected, uh, but he didn't, he didn't really plan for this to go on and on. This was uh, going to be almost like a boot camp. They were going to get some instruction. They were going to get some exercise. Um, you know, they, they encountered the Amalekites coming down uh, into Egypt because Egypt had been decimated. That dynasty was done. Then you get the Hyksos dynasty because the Amalekites move in, and that's what that was. Um, so God was just kind of getting this bunch of brick makers ready to do battle when they got to the promised land. All right, so they're in the wilderness. They're camped out. Um, you know, the, the interesting thing, what we're going to see here is, you know, in the wilderness, um, there tends to be a temptation, right? Um, and the reason we got to the wilderness, the reason there was a curse and the world became a wilderness uh, is because Adam failed on three points, right? So the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, right? So that was, you know, yea, hath God said, uh, looks good to eat, it'll give you wisdom, you'll be as gods, that's, that's three points, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, all right? Israel is presented with the same three tests, uh, and I think you know how that's going to go, all right? Uh, but the last Adam was presented with the same three tests in the wilderness. Uh, and how did they do? They, um, how did he do? Right? Uh, he did it right. Amen. Okay. He, he passed the test. Um, make, turn these stones into bread. Cast yourself down from this temple. Um, and then uh, I'll give you all these kingdoms. Okay. Uh, and how does, how does Christ answer Satan? Uh, with the words from uh, the Pentateuch, right? From the book of the law. Uh, so that's what we're studying now. And an interesting thing, when, when Satan took Christ up to the temple, all right? Um, you ever wonder how Satan was able to set foot on the temple? What do we know about the temple? What was it supposed to be? It's just like what he told Moses at the burning bush, right? This is holy ground. How does Satan get to walk on holy ground? It wasn't holy anymore. And Jesus told the Pharisees that. Uh, Lo, your house, your house is left to you desolate. Mm -hmm. Right? So he, he cleansed the temple. Um, my father's house is to be a house of prayer. Uh, and then immediately after that, Christ tells them, Lo, your house is left to you desolate. Uh, and lo and behold, what had uh, Christ called the Pharisees, right? You sons of snakes, your father, the devil. Um, so the reason Satan was able to set foot on the temple, because it was his, right? God, Yahweh had left it, right? We're going to see something similar here in Exodus. Okay, so verse 3, you can kind of consider that. Uh, the opening of the book of the covenant here in chapter 19, Moses went up unto God. The Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. So God is, is reminding them, uh, here's, here's my bona fides, here's why I get to declare these things, this is why uh, you're going to do them, uh, because I'm the one who brought you out of Egypt. Now why on eagles' wings? Right? Well, when you see something like birds and, you know, wings and eagles and stuff like that, think the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy, the Holy Spirit came, hovered over the face. Uh, sure. After the flood, the Spirit blew in, hovered, right? So 
uh, flying in, things like that. That's an imagery from the Holy Spirit. So the Trinity uh, was very much involved in getting Israel out of Egypt. So that's a reference to the Holy Spirit and brought you unto myself. Okay, so the Spirit brings the people to the Father. All right, that makes sense. Amen. Uh, now, therefore, and you know, this you see this elsewhere, right? When Jesus was baptized, uh, the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove. Uh, and someone was telling Martin Luther once, you know, well, they they claim to have the Holy Spirit too. And Martin Luther's response was, I don't care if they swallow the Holy Spirit wings and feathers and all, they're wrong. <laughs> feathers and all. Um, we could do with some more feathers and all sometimes. Amen. So, verse 5, now, now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. Right? So Israel is to be special. They're to be set apart. Uh, they're going to be a peculiar people, a peculiar treasure, all right? Now, what does the New Testament say about Christ, right? Uh, all, all the treasures of wisdom are stored up in Christ, right? But this starts to be delivered to Israel, right? It's the same language. Uh, and, and why? Because God owns everything, right? It's all his. For all the earth is mine. So he's sovereign. He gets to say uh, who's who and where's where um, and that's what he's about to do you're going to be unto me a kingdom of priests a holy nation these are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel uh, so Moses came called for the elders of the people whenever you see the elders show up there to be witnesses and judges right so God's trying to make them witnesses faithful witnesses uh, that's what he's going for uh, but also judges that was part of what the elders were there to do uh, and he laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. Which words? Well, hadn't got to all of them yet. Okay? <laughs> um, so that when God is speaking and Moses is going up and down, up and down, it's like God's playing uh, an accordion with time. All right? So when you read the Exodus, there's like this, uh, they're progressing and then they back up and there's repetition. That repetition is there as kind of a marker of how God is telling the story, but he's moving, he's kind of distorting time in and out because God gets to do that, all right? So he puts it before their faces. Um, so God is an in-your-face kind of God. He doesn't shy away. Uh, the earth is his. He is the living God. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He's all-wise. He's also all-loving, right? Mm -hmm. He's all-merciful. His loving kindness endures forever, uh, but he's there in their faces. Now, when we read that, something we ought to think about is Jacob in Genesis 32, 30, right? He wrestles with the Lord, and he says, I'm going to call this place Peniel because I've been face to face with God and survived, right? <laughs> I lived. Well, well the people were living, and they come face to face with God. And what's he putting before their face? Now, how do you get face to face with God? His words, right? So when we study and read the Bible, right? If we read the Bible in service, in church, or we're studying it independently, what are we doing? We are face to face with the living God. That's how uh, incredible and wonderful and important it is to read our Bible. Because that's what we're up to. And uh, as we come face to face with the word, um, God is uh, demonstrating his authority. He's giving blessing. Uh, and he's also demonstrating their destiny. Okay. There to be a, a, a peculiar people, a peculiar treasure, kingdom of priests, all those types of things. Okay. Verse 8. And all the people... Uh, they come face to face with God, and they say, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And all God's people said, yeah, right, because <laughs> we, we've read the rest of the story. But we experience that in our life, right? So Paul uh, in 1 Corinthians says, look, all this that's happening uh, to the nation of Israel, that's there for our examples, uh, for the church, Okay, these are examples for the church. So the church gets revved up and say, yes, Lord, we're going to follow you. That's what we're going to do. And when we don't do it, 
we we got to repent. Amen. We, this, we read this and we say, ooh, right? Because we've done that. We've done that individually. We've done that corporately uh, as the body of Christ. Amen. All that we have spoken, all the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses went back, returned the word to the people unto the Lord. Uh, and the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with thee and believe thee forever. And Moses told the word to the people unto the Lord. So we know that they need a mediator. Uh, then we talked about this last time. God tells Moses to tell the people to do their laundry. Okay. Uh, this is sanctifying. All right. And um, interesting enough, the word sanctify and sanitize have the same root. Okay. So, uh, what's, so what does he tell the people to do? Clean up. What does God do? He comes down in smoke and fire and torches that mountain and sits there. What's he doing? He's cleaning it, right? He's sanctifying it. He's turning it into holy ground. This is what God does, right? Uh, when he sent in an orbital strike in the Sodom and Gomorrah, what was he doing? He was purifying it. He was cleansing it. He was sanctifying it, right? This is what God does. This is what progressive sanctification is about burning up all of the old stuff, right? So the old things have passed away. Lo, all things are made new. So that's what God is doing in our lives, all right? Uh, I think we talked about, um, yeah, we talked about verse 15, explaining what that was about. So verse 16, we get this heavenly court, the glory cloud, um, you know, sanctification, <coughs> sanitizing, God comes down, he tests, and he judges, all right? Um, verse 21, the Lord said to Moses, go down, charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish, okay? So the looky-loos, be on the watch for them, right? So God's appointed, <laughs> told Moses to appoint these elders. Uh, they're essentially deacons to watch out for the people, okay? I don't want you to get burned, right? So that's kind of what's happening when deacons come through with the Lord's uh, table, with the Lord's supper. It's about fencing the table, setting these boundaries, just like Moses, God had Moses have the elders do, uh, because you don't want to um, go somewhere God tells you not to go and get burned up, right, and perish. So that's what that language about the Lord's supper, when Paul's describing that and taking it unworthily, that's, that's what that's about. Okay. And uh, verse 24, um, get thee down and thou shalt come up, up and down, up and down, thou and Aaron with thee. Uh, so now some more people get to come, right? So they're cleaned up. Uh, Aaron can come with you, but not the priests and the people. They can't break through uh, because uh, they come up. If they come up unto the Lord, verse 24, lest he break forth upon them. All right. Coming up to God without invitation, without welcome, uh, what's that like? That's like the Tower of Babel, all right? And that didn't, that didn't work out for them. God <laughs> broke forth upon them, and they got scattered. And here God's being very clear, they're, they're going to die, okay? All right, and then verse uh, chapter 20, verse 1, And God spake all these words, saying the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, okay? I'm not going to go through all these. Just know that there's two tables, okay? Okay. Um, uh, and I'm the Lord thy God, brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So this starts the first table of the law. That's, that's about our relationship with God. Um, um, and that, that relationship uh, is that we are to love the Lord, uh, our God, with all that we are, all that we have. And how did we get that? He gave it to us. Right. right? So we're, we're to give him everything so devotion to God and the second table is about loving others right the second table um, um, honor thy father and thy mother thou shalt not kill uh, don't uh, adultery stealing lying coveting that's that's a relationship with others that's the second table of the law okay um, convert down to verse 18 uh, now we're back okay to the thunderings the lightnings the trumpet the mountain smoking, uh, and when the people saw it, they got spooked. They removed and stood afar off. Verse 19, and the people, they said unto Moses, 
Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. Okay? Uh, they need a filter. All right? They can't handle the truth. They can't handle it directly from the source. That's too much. Even though these are the same, this is the same bunch that says, yes, Lord, we'll do it. Right? Everything you said. Now they're, say, now they're already saying, eh, maybe it's a bit much. Right? I wasn't ready for all that. Okay? Uh, you know, and that's kind of the zeal of the new believer, right? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I'm fired up. Then I read the thing and hold it up. Right? <laughs> that's the fine, fine print. I wasn't quite ready for that. Nobody told me about that. All right. Uh, so God is delivering an awesome message, right? Uh, it's an awesome delivery, uh, and it, in, it induces fear of the Lord, okay? What's the fear of the Lord? It's his word. Uh, in verse 19, um, uh, we don't want to die. Uh, so 20, Moses said to the people, fear not. <laughs> Easier said than done. Moses said to the people, fear not, for God is come to prove you. Don't be scared. God's fixing to put you to the test. Well, that's just pat on the back. Isn't it? That's, I, it says right here, it made them all feel better, and they're very, very happy, and saying kumbaya. Right? Um, Moses says, fear not, for God has come to prove you. Now, when God comes down, when we invite God down, uh, and Leviticus spells this out very clearly, when you uh, invite God down, better be ready. Okay? Because when he comes down, just like he's doing here, he's going to judge, right? Uh, and when his glory comes down, there's a, a distinct possibility that unholiness and unrighteousness will not stand. Right? <laughs> not a distinct possibility, but a guarantee, right? That's what God is saying. Um, he's going to prove you that his fear may be before your faces that ye sin not. He's going to, here, here's that putting the word in your face again. Why? So you don't sin. So you don't die. Okay? That's 2 Timothy, Timothy 3.16, right? Uh, the word is given for doctrine, uh, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness, for correction. Right? That's what's going on here. Right? That's, God is giving his word so that you will sin not. So you'll stay right. And, uh, and the people felt real good, so they stood far off. And Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. Right? Uh, now in verse 22, uh, the Lord said unto Moses, Thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. You've seen talk? How do you see talk? If you're watching a TV show and you want to see them talk, what can you do? <laughs> Put the captions on. <laughs> you can see words, right? What's God telling them? That's right. Right? Here's the word. This is how we see God talk, right? That's what the written word is. That's what written language is all about, right? And, and in chapter 24, uh, it says Moses writes it down in a book. So there's that time distortion. Again, I've talked with you from heaven. Well, I thought he was on the mountaintop. Here's where God is, is laying out that uh, this the Mount Sinai is a picture of heaven. Uh, the tabernacle is going to picture be a picture of Mount Sinai, which is a picture of heaven. So the tabernacle is going to be a picture of heaven. Uh, what does he say in verse 23? Right. So here's here's three things that God wants them to do. Verse 23, 24, 26. You shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall you make unto you gods of gold. How they do with that? God, God's telling them, hey, here's, here's what I want you to do. He knows they're about to break it, right? We don't get a few, we just a few chapters down the road. Uh, 24, an altar of earth thou shalt make unto me. Uh, and what kind of altar did they make? Not dirt, right? Not dirt. Um, and if you make an altar of stone, right, which is big dirt, Thou shalt not build it of hewn stone, for if thou lift thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Right? The idea here is when you make an altar to God, he wants them to use stuff he has made. Amen. And they are not to take their tools, which God gives them, but they are not to take their tools and try to improve upon what he's made. Right? That's why they can't chip away at the stone and do it like that. 
uh, because he is developing, he is building, he is providing. God gives the chief cornerstone that's perfectly fit, right? Um, so man cannot improve on God's handiwork. That's what he's telling them. And of course they're going to mess that up. Verse 26, Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar that thy nakedness not, uh, be not discovered thereon. Okay, what's, what's that about? Um, well, it's, it's going to come up in a few places, uh, but this um, uh, uh, showing thy nakedness is, is about uh, sexual immorality, harlotry, and, and this is setting up this equivalence of harlotry and idolatry. All right, So you'll see God use that motif over and over and over again. Uh, and then uh, when it says, you know, uh, uh, in chapter 32 of Exodus, uh, verse 6, it's going to say, at the golden calf, they rose up to play. All right, they're not playing Monopoly. Right, it's not reindeer games. It's something else. <laughs> so that's a picture of sexual immorality, and Paul uh, uh, specifically says that in First Corinthians ten Amen. seven. Um, okay. Um, all right. So these are the judgments that you'll set uh, be set before you, um, and then he goes into a list of. Uh, laws talking about Sabbath. Um, to do that, he begins with slavery in chapter 21. The Bible allows indenture, but it is certainly anti slavery, right? He just brought them out of Egypt, just brought them out of bondage. Uh, and so, he, you know, these laws are about Sabbath of rest, okay? Not being uh, uh, tyr uh, uh, tyrannical, under, under the tyranny of bondage, all right? Verse 6. Uh, you, you know, after you can let your slaves go, um, but if one really loves the household, loves the master, he can be a permanent slave. Uh, he's a, called a houseborn slave. Uh, they take a, an awl and, you know, nail the earlobe to the door, the, the doorpost. Obviously, blood on the doorpost. What's that sound like? Passover, right? Um, and, and after Passover, they lived, and so uh, they were essentially adopted. These are my children now. They were adopted by God. At Passover, and so this houseborn slave becomes an adopted son. Right? You saw that already in Genesis with Abraham and Eliezer. Lord, you said you were going to uh, give me a household, lots of nations, uh, all that stuff. Uh, still hasn't happened yet. So Eliezer, my servant, is going to inherit, right? Because he was an adopted houseborn son. Okay, um, he was born at the door. That's that's what that means. All right. Um, and then there's uh, some information about maid servants, okay, and it's, this is really about protecting women because Pharaoh uh, treated the Hebrew women harshly. Um, uh, okay, don't, don't murder, verses 12 to 15. There's some other offenses, uh, verse 16, about thievery. Uh, Stealeth a man, selleth him, if he found, be found in his hand, he'll surely be put to death. Uh, how do you know the Bible's anti-slavery? Because it says if you steal a man, you die. Uh, um, Amen. Uh, what do you think would happen to the human trafficking trade if that were the penalty? Okay. Start to evaporate pretty quick. Amen. It? Uh, and it didn't just say, you know, if, if, if you steal them or sell them or be found in your, there in your house. So you kind of knew something was up, so that's enough. That's enough for God. This is what's called theonomics, okay? God's law, right? So the, the study of theonomy is incredibly interesting. Um, verse 17, he that curses, curses it. Uh, yep. Y'all help me. Curses. Thank you. His father or his mother shall surely be put to death, all right? So a uh, teenager smarts off to mama, kill him. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that what God's saying? I think not. <laughs> Curse here does have to do with words, uh, but it's, it's language and life, okay? So, um, you know, uh, uh, reviling, cursing, it's a similar word to what God did to Adam and Eve, cursed them from the garden. Uh, out you go to the point of death, all right? So, you know, um, um, sending um, your, your elderly, destitute parents, I, you know, uh, sorry, out you go, okay, um, to death. That's, that's what it's talking about. Uh, and, and even Jesus brings that up, tells the Pharisees, 
um, you know, that money that you were setting aside to, to you know, take care of, you know, bring in a hospital bed and a nurse to take care of uh, mom and daddy, where y'all have said, uh, you know what, I think the Lord needs this money more. So I'm going to set this aside for the Lord, and Jesus curses them, right? So you, uh, they're twisting the law. What law? This law, okay? Uh, you'll say this gift is Corbin. You'll, you'll read that in, in the gospel. Amen. All right. Verse 22, eye for an eye, tooth for two. Uh, this is the establishment of the common law, right? Um, men strive her a woman with child so that her fruit, her baby, depart from her, and yet no mischief follow. He should be surely punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him. He shall pay as the judges determine. Okay, who determines? Judges, right? So all this eye for eye, tooth for tooth stuff, that's for the authorities. That's for the magistrate. That's for the judges, Okay. If you hit me and knock out my tooth, I do not get to come back and hit you and knock out your tooth. Right? That is not for individual to individuals. This is a judgment. This is for the authorities. All right. Um, all right. Uh, laws regarding oxen. Um, I was really trying to get to thou shalt not boil a kid in his mother's milk. Right? Anyway, <laughs> um, so if an ox, uh, verse 28, if an ox bore a man or woman, they die. The ox shall be surely stoned, his flesh shall be not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall be quit. All right. Oxen are uh, a symbol of wealth and uh, government service, national service, right? Think of the government, right? And the government's power is like an ox, all right? Sometimes like a bull in a china shop. But <laughs> ox is, that's, that's what it's about. So ox are nations, okay? Um, if... Um, and if you know they're, they're goring people, then that's one, one problem, right? Then that's a, a stiffer penalty. That's stoning, okay? Um, you know, if, if we wanted to apply something like this today, what would we as Christians do? Do we start chunking rocks? Hmm. How do we stone people? Okay, so there's, there's church discipline, right? But who's our rock? Christ. We get more. When, when Christians stone people for their offenses, we don't pretend like they're not offenses. We don't pretend like they're not sins. We just give them the rock. We give them the gospel. That's what Christians do, right? Amen. Um, so this this has implications in that. Um, I'll just I'll just tell you that. Um, so a nation that um, kills somebody, right, um, in this case, eventually it's going to be re referencing uh, the nation of Israel and what they did to Christ, right? Uh, the Jews gored Christ. Right. Right? They killed him, right? And if you look in verse 32, if the ox shall push, right, that push means gore him, right, hook him horns, a manservant or a maidservant, he shall give unto their master 30 shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. Right? Was Jerusalem, was the nation of Israel stoned? Sure was. In 70 AD, you read in the book of Revelation, let the rocks fall upon us. Right? Right. So this is, this is the same thing. So the rest of them, it could be nation to nation, right? If one nation digs a pit, sets a trap, takes power from another nation, there's problems there. There needs to be restitution. Um, we could be church to church, okay? So if one church tries to smear another church, um, that's, that's covered here, okay? That's a problem. There needs to be restitution. Chapter 22 really picks up the, the theme of restitution, um, and we'll just read uh, the first two verses. If a man shall steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. All right? Now, oxen, what's oxen about? People in authority, government, right? Wealthy people. They've got a lot of resources. They've got a lot of wealth. They've got a lot of power. Okay? So, uh, if... if uh, this power, this seat of authority, and who grants the authority? God. I heard it somewhere. God. Yeah. Say you, God loud. He likes it. Um, God grants this authority. 
uh, and then people rise up against that authority and break stuff, say like, I don't know, burning down a courthouse, damaging city hall, what's the, what's the punishment? Five times. Five times restitution. Now, do you think what happened a couple of years ago would have happened a couple of years ago if five times restitution, Amen. right? If a courthouse cost $5 million and the penalty is $25 million, I don't think there'd been so much burning and pillaging, <laughs> you, right? Amen. The economics, not such a bad idea. Um, four sheep, four sheep. Why five ox and four sheep, okay? Well, if you look, and you know, we'll get to it later. But um, in the sacrificial system, ox for the rich folks, they can they can they can bring a beef, okay? <laughs> poor folks, sheep. Amen. And if you're real real poor, turtle dove. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's feathers and all. Right? <laughs> uh, so the sheep, okay? So sheep is about poor people. So. Killing the sheep, what, what he's saying, yes, there's livestock implications here. That's the surface level reading. But when you read these laws, you've got to think, how does it apply to Christ? And how does it apply uh, practically in the new covenant, right? So there's practical applications um, beyond what's just, you know, dead, dead ox or dead sheep, all right? But, I mean, there's good stuff here for, you know, uh, one another and one another, absolutely. Um, but there's, there's greater meanings here that, that God points out. Um, so the sheep are the poor folks, right? This is about um, the wealthy tyrannizing or abusing the poor, okay? So if, the, if wealthy people come and take advantage of poor people, what's the restitution? Fourfold, right? And if you were in Brother Allen's Sunday school class a few weeks ago, what did he talk about? Right? Um, David gets upset when Nathan, the prophet Nathan tells him this story about a rich, rich man who stole a poor man's little lamb. That's right. And what does David say? Fourfold. Fourfold restitution. Um, and of course, got turned around, uh, you know, and, I, and I put him to death, right? David went one step further, <laughs> right? The Bible, Exodus says, four sheep for one sheep. Uh, he went further, right? He said death. He said, okay, well, that's why you're going to have fourfold death. On, that, was, that was David's punishment, right? Uh, and so he, he, his fourfold death came to his children. Um, so that's what, that's what that's talking about. Verse 2, if the thief be found breaking up and be smitten that he die, there shall be no blood shed, uh, no blood be shed for him. Right? That's the castle doctrine. All right? Somebody's breaking into your house and you kill them. You're, you're not liable for that. That's not a murder, okay? No, no blood to be shed. All right, that's, the book. that's not quite the Book of the Covenant, um, but um, uh, is it? Oh, the Book of the Covenant in, where are we? I've lost, my, I've lost my page. We're in 22, okay. I thought we were almost there. Book of the Covenant ends in 24, verse 7. But we'll get there, and then we'll wrap up with the temple. Amen. Closer than we were. That's right. That's that's progress. That's good. All right. Any any questions?